All right, it looks like we're ready to begin. Good evening, I'm Brianne Chittachimo from Allied Physicians Group, and thank you for joining prenatal breastfeeding. A few items before we begin this evening. If you have additional questions, there's a Q&A feature located at the bottom of the screen. We'll do our very best to answer as many questions during as we can during the Q&A at the end. Following this webinar, we will send out a link with a bunch of useful information um, some QR codes, a, a number to our new parent helpline, and information on where to find all of our experts. So again, thank you for joining us. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Carrie Firestein from Allied Physicians Group, who will be leading the discussion this evening. Thank you, Bree. Um, I'm Dr. Kerry Firestein, Chief Executive Officer of Allied Physicians Group, practicing pediatrician in Plainview for over 30 years, um, mother of three, and now grandmother of one. Congratulations to everybody who is listening tonight, because if you are listening, you likely have a new one in your life or coming into your life, and that really is so exciting. It's also a little bit scary, or a lot scary because there are so many decisions to be made. And there's so much advice out there. Sometimes the hardest thing for a parent is learning which advice to listen to and which advice to ignore. So congratulations for making it this far because you found Allied Physicians Group. And we are a group primarily of pediatricians and we are a trusted source of information for you. If you are listening um, tonight and you have a new baby, this is about breastfeeding. And there are lots of questions and lots of um, aspects to that, which we're gonna go through tonight. Having a baby is also, um, there are a lot of other questions that we need to answer for you. We do have separate newborn baby seminars, which Bree is gonna give you some information on. So tonight we're going to explore all the aspects of breastfeeding, why it's good, how you should do it. Um, Recently, I've had a lot of moms say, I wasn't so short, but you know what, with the formula shortage, I'd rather um, breastfeed, at least at the beginning. And you know what, that's a great reason as well. Anything that gets you to that point is totally fine with us. And Allied's feeling is that we are here to support you in your breastfeeding journey, whatever that may be. So tonight, we have some wonderful pediatricians. Um, so these are people who are trained in pediatrics who are also trained in breastfeeding medicine. So you are getting the benefit of both worlds. And I'm gonna allow them to introduce themselves and then we're gonna start and we're gonna have a lot of time at the end to answer questions. If you have any questions as we go, you can throw them into the question area or into the chat area. And I will either answer them as we go or one of the other panelists will, or we'll get to them at the end. Um, so Dr. Cher, you wanna start? Sure, happy to. Um, again, congratulations, and I'm so happy to, to see all of you here. Uh, I am a pediatrician practicing in Riverhead and Southhold out on the East End, and have been practicing breastfeeding medicine for 10, 15 years now. And uh, it's just uh, truly my pleasure to be here. I'm also the chief medical officer of the company. So I I'm here to represent the team and answer all questions and look forward to the session. Uh, Dr. Macaluso. Hi, I'm Dr. Lauren Macaluso. I'm a pediatrician and board certified lactation consultant and I have a breastfeeding medicine specialty practice in New Hyde Park. I was running a newborn nursery at a teaching, teaching hospital for about eight years and found a, a strong, strong need for further breastfeeding medical care in our community. So I am on year, just about to start year 17 um, with a breastfeeding medicine specialty practice, which I'm really proud of to really care for mom and baby under one roof. And I'm really proud to be a partner and ally doing that as well. Yeah, Dr. Macaluso is definitely a pioneer in her field. There certainly weren't a lot of women or a lot of doctors, physicians doing just breastfeeding medicine when she started. There still aren't a lot, but we're so happy to have her as part of Allied. Dr. Vizantine. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much, <clears throat> excuse me, for attending. Um, I'm Dr. Lisa Vizantine. I'm also a pediatrician and a certified lactation consultant. 
I have the pleasure of working with Dr. Cher, uh, who has also served as my mentor. I've been doing pediatrics and breastfeeding medicine for about 12 years. I started getting interested in breastfeeding medicine while I was doing my pediatric residency um, and then had the honor and privilege of uh, working with Dr. Cher both as a patient when I had my own child uh, and had my own uh, issues that she was able to help me with, um, and then eventually becoming her um, colleague, and we worked together out in Riverhead and South Hold. Thank you, Lisa. Whatever you did towards the end with your volume was much better, so keep doing oh. that. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, and now it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Lena Edelstein, who actually works with me um, in Plainview and who recently received her IBCLC. And she is just a pleasure to, to watch how somebody with three young children decided to do this and take the learning and the extra time and the time she spends with parents. Um, it's so wonderful to see how happy they are after they leave her. So Dr. Elstein, um, I know I introduced you a little bit. I'm sorry for that. I will let you introduce yourself and then we can go right into your slides. All right. Hi, so I'm Lena Edelstein. I'm one of the pediatricians, as Dr. Firestein said, at Pediatric Health Associates in Plainview. Um, I actually got into this uh, starting a few years ago when I went to Dr. Macaluso as a patient with my third baby. And I thought third time around, I'd completely understand what was going on. And we struggled, but she helped me. And then it, realized, it made me realize that I want to be able to help my patients in the same way. Um, so I think let's, I'm a certified lactation consultant as well. And I think where you can go to the next slide. So why breastfeed? The World Health Organization and UNICEF recommends that newborns initiate breastfeeding ideally within the first hour of birth and receive nothing but human milk for the first six months of life. At six months of age, children should begin eating safe and adequate complementary foods while continuing to breastfeed for up to two years of age and beyond as mutually desired and beneficial for mom and baby. Later in this talk, um, Dr. Macaluso will touch upon how the updated statement from the American Academy of Pediatrics is more in alignment with these global recommendations. And she will also touch upon both physical and social obstacles that are frequently encountered as well as things to consider when making the best decisions for you and your baby. Breastfeeding is designed for both mom and baby. Breast milk provides all the energy and nutrients the infant needs for the first month's life, and breast milk contains a variety of biologic factors that protect against many common childhood illnesses, um, viral illnesses, ear infections, diarrhea, to name a few of them. There are a multitude of health benefits for mom as well. Breastfeeding reduces the risk of breast and ovarian cancer. It reduces the risk of future heart disease. It helps reverse the insulin resistance that develops during pregnancy. And insulin resistance is what is associated with the development of type two diabetes later on in life. Um, and breastfeeding can also delay the return of Menzies. And in a first world country like where we are right now, um, there's other options for birth control, but it does help with child spacing to an extent. So let's talk about what's in breast milk that makes it the perfect nourishment for baby. The type of sugar in breast milk is perfect for infant brain growth, and the types of protein in breast milk are uniquely perfect for human babies. There are two types of protein in breast milk, whey and casein, and there's way more whey in human milk compared to other mammalian milk like that of cows, which is what is in commercial formulas. Why am I telling you about these proteins? So one, because breast milk is very easily digested. Two, because the types of protein in breast milk have many uses in the baby body. The proteins in breast milk provide essential amino acids for growth. They protect against bacterial and viral infections in the form of antibodies and enzymes. And they act as a carrier for hormones and vitamins. There are other bioactive components unique to human breast milk as well, including white blood cells that give further immunity to baby and specialized sugars that promote good gut bacteria growth. Breast milk is amazing in that it is not always the same, unlike what comes off of a store shelf. Its component types and ratios vary through the various stages of life from newborn through infancy and through toddlerhood. You are actually automatically responding to your child's needs. 
these dynamic factors offer the optimal nutrition for your baby. All right, and you can go to the next slide. So how does the body work to make this happen? Newborns and infants should feed on demand, meaning based on early feeding cues as will be described on an upcoming slide. Breastfeeding more frequently actually leads to more milk, and we'll get to why that is. Another key point is that you do not, and actually should avoid, waiting for the breast to fill up before feeding. Emptied breasts lead to more milk, or a better way of thinking of this concept is that unemptied breasts leads to less milk production. If breasts stay full, the body gets feedback that no further milk making is needed. So emptying the breast leads to more milk. Now, I'm not going to go too deep into physiology here. The two hormones I want to mention are prolactin and oxytocin. Prolactin is needed to trigger the breast to make milk. Its levels circulate through the body are highest at the time of delivery, but the levels do drop. Prolactin levels spike back up when suckling occurs. So remember this little fact when Dr. Vicente talks about getting off to a good start. Prolactin for milk production and levels spike up with suckling. The other hormone I want to mention is oxytocin, AKA the love hormone. It is also released with suckling and it's also released with skin to skin holding, which is when you hold your baby in nothing but a diaper on your naked chest. Oxytocin has numerous effects on the body, including inducing the milk letdown and it gives you this wonderful sensation of love and bonding. So now let's talk about how a good latch actually looks and feels. On this slide, you can see a drawing of a deep asymmetric latch. Generally, we think of symmetry as good, but when it comes to latching, this deep asymmetric latch is what we're aiming for. Deep meaning that part of the areola, which is the dark circle around the nipple, is taken into the mouth as well as the nipple, because right, it's called breastfeeding, not nipple feeding. And asymmetric, meaning you can see the baby isn't directly on the nipple like a bullseye. More areol is taken in on the chin side than the nose side. A deep asymmetric latch should not be painful, or if there is any discomfort, it should resolve within the first minute or so. A gentle tugging sensation is to be expected. Now in the corner, there is a, a QR code I highly recommend scanning into your phone and watching. Um, it will also be included in the post-webinar email, so if you miss it right now, don't worry, you'll get access to it. The QR code will take you to a video produced by the Global Health Media Project. The video is just over 10 minutes long, and it demonstrates the attachment of multiple babies to the breast. And a video visual is just so much better at demonstrating latching than any stagnant drawing or verbal description can do. So yeah, take a look at it. Um, the Global Health Media Project has a number of excellent videos related to breastfeeding, and I encourage you to look through them if you have the opportunity to. Um, and now Dr. Vicentin will talk about getting off to a good start. I look forward to meeting some of you in the future. Thank you. Can you guys hear me okay now? Yeah, okay, great, thank you. Um, so now that we've talked about the benefits of breastfeeding for both you and your baby, um, we're gonna talk about how to get off to a good start. Um, so as soon as possible after birth, as Dr. Edelstein had mentioned, put your baby to breast. Um, starting early and often, as she mentioned, will increase those prolactin spikes. That is what will help your body transition um, from prior to pregnancy when you were already starting to make milk um, and make colostrum for your baby. The more often your baby eats, the more that stimulates your body and your body will go through those different hormonal cascades um, to transition from colostrum to your more mature milk. Um, the general goal is eight to 12 times, eight to 12 feedings in 24 hours. That works out to be about every two to three hours, but babies are often not as regimented as we would like them to be. Um, we often say that they have to eat exactly every two hours. Sometimes babies want to eat every hour. Um, they may cluster feed where they eat a few times in a row close together, and then it may space out a little bit more. Um, and so when I talk about um, a little leader, how to know 
if your baby is eating enough, you're going to be thinking about both how long has it been since my baby last fed, as well as how many times in the past 24 hours um, did they eat. And yes, thank you, Dr. Firestein. Babies can't tell time. Um, we as grownups do. Um, it's one of the ways that we use to um, measure it, but we're also going to go based on their um, feeding cues, which I'm going to talk about in a upcoming slide. In addition, um, discussing your goals with both your partner and your medical team can help you get off to a good start. Um, making sure that everybody has talked about what your goals are um, so that they can help you achieve those. Most hospitals have nurses um, who are also lactation consultants or have otherwise been trained to help you right after birth. Attending these webinars are great. Reading, watching videos are great. Um, but there's also having your baby. There's only so much you can do before you actually have your baby. Um, and to have somebody there to help you ask for help after the, after the delivery. Even if you feel like things are going well, a lot of times it's helpful just to have somebody come in and watch. And that's a lot of what we do also in our offices um, is to review the baby's latch, make sure it's a good deep latch and um, give you some sort of hands-on help to make sure that you're getting off to the best possible start that you can. Next slide, please. Um, so this is one of the most common questions that we get and a source of a lot of um, sometimes anxiety for parents is how do they know that their baby is getting enough? Um, their baby can't talk to them. All they can do is cry. Um, that's the baby's main way of communicating. And as a new parent, it's up to you to figure out what is my baby trying to tell me? Um, and there's a lot of things that they're going to be trying to tell you. Uh, you're often going to get a lot of advice um, from family members and other people who may always suggest um, that the baby needs to eat more. Um, this is an example of a breastfeeding log. Some hospitals give these out. You can find them on the internet. Um, it's a way to track. There's lots of apps now that will track how often your baby is feeding, how often they're peeing and pooping. So there are a few different ways that you will know how um, if your baby is eating enough. One is the frequency. So how many times in a day and how long it's been since they last ate. Um, and then you're also going to be looking at how often your baby is peeing and pooping. If the baby is eating enough, then enough is coming out. Um, and so that's one of the ways at home that you'll know that the baby is eating enough. A general rule of thumb for the first week of life, the baby should have at least one wet diaper and one stool for each day of life. So for example, the baby is three days old, the minimum would be three urine diapers and three stool diapers, which is what those check boxes are on there. After the first seven days of life, it becomes um, a little bit more variable. And often by that point, you've started to learn your baby's feeding cues a little bit more, which I'm going to talk about in the next slide. Um, and also visiting your pediatrician or your provider and checking the baby's weight is another way that you're going to know that your baby is eating enough. Next slide, please. Um, so feeding cues are um, an important skill to start learning as a new parent. You're just beginning to learn your baby, how they're trying to communicate with you, and learning how to recognize these feeding cues for your individual baby will help you know when it's time to feed your baby, in addition to looking at the clock, because as we said, babies can't tell time. Um, there are early feeding cues and late feeding cues. Ideally, you would be seeing these early feeding cues and you would be putting the baby to breast at this first sign of those early feeding cues. It's easier for a baby to latch if they're in a sort of calm, quiet state and they're starting to give you those feeding cues. Once a baby becomes very upset and has the late um, feeding cue of crying, it's often difficult to latch that baby. Um, so those early signs are the fists coming to the mouth, often, Babies will start to do that before they're even fully awake. Their eyes may still be closed. You'll start to see them stirring a little bit. They'll be starting to put their hands towards their mouth. Once the baby becomes a little bit more alert and active, they'll often start rooting, turning their head towards the breast. They may start opening their um, opening and closing their mouth and sticking out their tongue um, and then eventually putting their hands in their, uh, in their mouth. That would be the time when you start seeing those cues that you would ideally put your baby to breast. 
when in doubt, feed the baby. Um, it is very hard to overfeed a breastfed baby. Um, so if your baby is giving any of these feeding cues, put them to the breast. The more often they eat, the more practice both you and your baby will get at breastfeeding. Um, and then also the more that will stimulate your body to make more milk. Some babies, they go from sound asleep to crying very quickly um, within a matter of seconds. And you may miss some of those feeding cues, especially early on. Um, if you are unable to latch your baby because they're crying so much, there are different techniques that you can try to calm the baby, offering them a clean finger or a pacifier to suck on, doing some skin to skin, as Dr. Edelstein mentioned, having a baby who's just in a diaper on your bare chest, rocking them, some babies prefer to be swaddled, um, different ways that you can try to calm the baby and then put them to the breast. It will make it easier for them to latch on um, if they're in that sort of calm, quiet state. And I believe that is the end of that slide. And now we're gonna move on to um, some common obstacles. Okay, I'm up. <laughs> First, I'd like to start off with the recognition of language being as inclusive as possible when discussing infant feeding. It's important with individual families to use language they identify and are comfortable with. So for the sake of tonight's group experience, we're using the traditional term of breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is a journey and you can meet challenges during your experience. A common one is sore nipples. The most common reason for nipple discomfort and possible trauma like cracks or bleeding is a lack of education and assistance with deep latch mechanics. You got a really good feel from Dr. Edelstein tonight on how to latch and have a really cool link to a great QR code on helping you to visualize it again as well. If it isn't going well and you're experiencing pain, it's best to make an appointment to evaluate you and your baby. We can examine both of you, watch a feed, and give you hands-on help with achieving a deep, comfortable latch. Many parents share that no matter how much they've read or how many videos they've watched, there's nothing like hands-on help with latch. We can then determine if any further interventions or treatment is needed for you and your baby. It is safe and compatible in the meantime to use an organic nipple cream or balm while you're waiting evaluation. Another common reason for sore nipples is engorgement. Engorgement usually happens three to five days after delivery, but it can occur later after a C-section. Engorgement is pain, firmness, and swelling in both of your breasts as milk production is activated. Recommendations are to room in with your baby during your hospital stay to allow for normal breastfeeding. It can be helpful also to hand express to soften your breasts and provide milk to your baby as well if you're having difficulty with latch. Firstdroplets.com is a Stanford University-based website that's focused on the first hours and days after delivery with educational videos, including videos on hand expression. It's worth checking it out. And again, it's first, F-I-R-S-T, droplets, D-R-O-P-L-E-T-S.com. Ice can also be helpful during engorgement. Lactating breasts are highly vascular. There's a lot of blood flow going on there and cold constricts blood vessels and is therapeutic. Most moms give quick feedback that it feels good. And it's also helpful to wear a supportive bra to help prevent gravity from pulling fluid down in your breasts. You can have swelling and discomfort in the lower part of your breast during engorgement and an appropriately fitted supportive bra can help you to avoid this. You wanna be really careful with some of the recommendations that you may come across, especially online. You wanna really avoid deep, aggressive massage with your hands or with massaging devices as those can cause worse swelling and tissue injury. You wanna avoid saline soaks and Epsom salts and a silicone pump as those can macerate skin. I'm gonna change gears now and move over to weight, which I believe is the next slide. It's normal for your baby to lose weight after delivery. Sorry, Brie, I may have messed that up and they were all on the same slide. I apologize for that. <laughs> it's normal to, to, for your baby to lose weight after delivery. We report this as the percent of their birth weight loss. Normal weight loss for full term breastfed infants is seven to 10% of their birth weight. I mentioned engorgement happening around day three to five, and this is when milk production usually increases. 
once milk increases, or as we say, your milk is in, breastfed babies like to gain an ounce a day. If we see weight loss or slow gain below these normal parameters, this is a signal to have a mom and baby breastfeeding evaluation and is a potential medical indication for supplementation. The goal is to help you establish a feeding plan after evaluation of latch, positioning, and milk transfer. This is where support, thorough support, is needed for mom and baby to evaluate both of you to help you to protect and build your milk production through latching and or pumping if indicated and to identify the problem. Our aim is to help work with you to have a successful breastfeeding journey that fits your goals. Moving on to pumping. We're finding pumps can impact us more than you'd think. Many moms are using pumps early without an indication. The recommended times to use a pump are when you're separated from your baby or have a medical indication like your baby's gaining weight slowly as we just mentioned. Moms are using silicone pumps on the opposite breast during latch, which can impact latch and positioning and take away from your baby's present intake. There's an expression in our field, be careful not to feed the freezer. You really wanna make sure your baby is getting your milk in the here and now, and we can worry about that later. We can help you then develop a plan for pumping or your return to work or upon separation. Many moms are pumping excessively in addition to breastfeeding, over-programming their milk supplies leading to overproduction. The recommendation is normal physiologic breastfeeding, allowing your baby to program your milk supply to their needs. A visit can be really helpful to go over your individual breastfeeding and pumping plan, learn about pump plan sizing and how to use your pump. Add-ons. <laughs> Add-ons are some of the items that many of you consider purchasing to help breast make breastfeeding happen. I've mentioned a few of them already, such as the silicone hand pumps, massaging devices. You really just wanna be careful here. Some of them can really cause problems. And this is a real area where less is really more. Um, you know, the longer I've been doing this, I'm 20 years into breastfeeding and watching moms and babies and to watch what's gone on over the past couple of decades. I think currently a lot of you are made to feel online that you need to go out and buy a number of different devices and pumps and, and all these things to help make it happen. And we're finding it's really usurping your confidence, your money, and it's really making a lot of women feel more anxious about this process. So you really wanna keep it as simple as possible you really wanna find educated help to really help you to navigate your own personal experience. Social media is a popular source for breastfeeding information, information but you really wanna tread carefully here. You can find recommendations without any science behind them that can truly impact your physical and mental health. And we're seeing increased amounts of anxiety in new moms heightened by social media. The goal is to truly have access to evidence-based support and resources with science-based. And I'd like to share more of that now with you. I'm on the current slide now. I apologize for zooming ahead. <laughs> Breastfeeding is normal. It's not best. It's not a special sauce. It's just plain normal. It's what our babies were meant to do. And it's so much more than food. In an ideal normal vaginal birth, we deliver the baby. And by the way, I feel bad for not including C-section. You can latch right away after a section as well. Um, the baby goes to the mom's chest in that ideal world in the first hour of life. Newborns are kept in skin-to-skin -skin contact on the mom's chest and have better body and skin temperatures by doing this. And believe it or not, cool fact, the blood flow to your chest in a new mom is actually greater than the blood flow to your brain, which I think is pretty darn amazing. <laughs> it shows how important and normal this process is. Breastfeeding truly is warmth. Newborns utilize their senses and their instinctive abilities to breastfeed. They actually have the scent of amniotic fluid on their hands when they're born, and they tend to lick their hands and work their way towards the breast to self-attach if you leave them to their own devices. Mom's sweat and secretions from the glands on the dark circle of your breast or areola smell and taste familiar, similar to this amniotic fluid, helping them find their way. Newborns have a visual preference for contrast, and there's a big dark circle bullseye areola ready and waiting for them, literally saying, eat here. All of these inputs make breastfeeding normal and instinctual. Early milk is known as colostrum. It comes in small amounts, it's high in antibodies, 
it protects your baby from what you're both exposed to. The average intake of colostrum in the full term healthy newborn is a half to two teaspoons per feed for the first 24 hours. That's not a lot. Do not pressure yourself to make you feel like you need to be producing extreme amounts. You're not gonna feel a lot yet and it will come. Try really hard to have faith in your body. Milk supply will increase in response to your infant's needs. Many of us question our abilities to make enough milk for our babies and feel the need to use, utilize formula as more food. But remember, breastfeeding is much more than just food. It's human instinct, it's warmth, it's protection, it's bonding, it's what we're supposed to do. The challenge is it may not feel very instinctual right about now. Many of us are facing barriers to breastfeeding. We're living farther away from our extended family and it's challenging to find support. Many of our mothers didn't breastfeed and society has not fully embraced this as normal yet. Most of us are having a hard time finding evidence-based consistent information about breastfeeding. We're receiving mixed messages and we don't know who to believe. We're returning to work with varying levels of support to establish breastfeeding or to establish a flexible work plan to breastfeed and express milk. And when breastfeeding problems occur, we don't know where to turn. This is a physical, mental, social, and emotional climactic transition, which can be really challenging to handle. And it's known as the fourth trimester. Remember, it's normal and there is evidence-based help out there and you are meeting it all tonight. <laughs> this is when breastfeeding is so much more than food. And I'd like to reiterate, as Dr. Ellison mentioned, you mobilize fat stores, you reset your metabolism, you have a decreased rate of diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease in the future. Oxytocin, that love hormone that helps with bonding, also stimulates smooth muscle contraction lining the breast, milk producing cells, and the uterus. So you have less bleeding after delivering less anemia. You're less likely to ovulate while breastfeeding exclusively with helps with child spacing and you have a decreased risk of ovarian and breast cancer. These things are really real. Part of the, and I'm gonna to get to more a little bit later, the American Academy of Pediatrics policy update um, that's been included to include the two years or more as mutually desired by mom and baby. A large push for that two years is the strong health risk reduction for moms when you breastfeed for over a year. Um, and it's important for us to know that we don't want to feel like there's pressure that we have to, but we really want to help you to make educated decisions in your duration of breastfeeding. Your baby also has a decreased risk of infections, including ear, gastrointestinal, lower respiratory tract, and, and a decreased risk of sudden infant death syndrome, childhood obesity, and diabetes. It's important to include that the breast and breastfeeding are not perfect. Some of us do have physical, social, and emotional reasons where we're unable to breastfeed, have a need for alternatives, or make a choice not to. Many moms and their partners express frustration stating, I'm told I should breastfeed, but I'm receiving little to no hands-on consistent help to execute it. And it's our major goal tonight is to help you know that you have a place to get that support for yourself, your family, and to help you reach your goals. This should, done, should be done through informed, educated, non-judgmental decision-making, thorough care with you and your family. Hands-on time-intensive mom and baby care should be universally included in med medical education and patient care, but we're just not there yet. This is what breastfeeding medicine is. Thorough mom and baby support. It can start prenatally and then continue on. With shorter hospital stays, families have been finding prenatal visits to be especially helpful to go into delivery informed and empowered with follow-up after to establish breastfeeding and then as needed throughout their breastfeeding journey with the ability to support, diagnose, treat, prescribe, image, and refer as needed. Breastfeeding telemedicine visits have also been really helpful, especially throughout COVID. They've been a wonderful way to provide full counseling and answer questions thoroughly. Patients have been asking me to continue them beyond COVID for follow-up questions, and I plan to do so. Lastly, the American Academy of Pediatrics updated their breastfeeding policy just a few weeks ago. It's been hot off the presses. There's been a lot of talk in the media, both positive and negative around this. The policy, as Dr. Elsie mentioned, extended the recommendation of breastfeeding duration from breastfeeding for one year or more as mutually desired by mom and baby to two years or more. People are voicing feelings of pressure and this not being consistent with the reality of the American mom. It's understandable that this is being felt. We are lacking, as I talked about, in universal support, protection and normalization of breastfeeding. 
we're recommending doing something that can be mentally and physically taxing and not, then not providing the support across healthcare, the workplace and society to help you to execute it. It's understandable to feel frustrated. The AAP goal is to push for more recognition of the normalness and risk reduction of breastfeeding and to help set policy to enable you to have a successful journey. The health benefits of mom and baby in the now and in your future and the impact on family, society, and the environment are tremendous. I look at this as a true call to action for us as pediatricians and society as a whole to step up and advocate and help make positive change, just as we're all trying to do for you guys tonight. So now I'm going to hand things off to Dr. Cher. All right, thanks so much, Lauren, and everybody, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to just sort of close us down with a few closing comments, and then there's always a lot of questions, so we'll just make sure we, we hit all those questions. But um, I really wanted to just piggyback a little bit on what Dr. Macaluso said, and um, in two particular things, one related to the, the pressure on social media and from people around you, and if now they're saying two years, the pressure, so much pressure. <laughs> that really the goal is to educate yourself, to decide what you want, to get the support you need to reach your goals, but that you decide what's best for you. And that we are not here to tell you what to do. We're here to try to help you reach your own personal specific goals. There is zero pressure. Um, on the flip side, I'll say that the, the um, the addition of the second year, it's interesting because there's also pressure on women who are, oh, you take, it's so hard to get started. And then once you get it going, the baby's all of a sudden a year old and they're feeling pressure to quit. It's like they become closet nursers, right? And we have so many, you know, when the baby's between the ages of one and two and they're like embarrassed to admit that they're still nursing. So there is no shame in anything that you decide to do. <laughs> so I really just wanted to, to call that out. And um, the other thing I wanted to point out that I sort of like to talk about, which is that the fact that since breastfeeding, as Dr. Macaluso points out, is normal, and that formula feeding is an alternative that many people choose and is, a, is an alternative, but that's the, the, the gold standard and the normalness is the, is the nursing. So I like to sometimes say that there's an increased risk of heart disease when you formula feed or artificial feed instead of saying that there's a decreased risk with breastfeeding just to kind of to shift the the perspective of really the normalcy of it um, so uh, my purpose here is just to bring to to everybody here uh, the perspective of when in doubt to reach out so uh, the first step, and I congratulate all of you for being here, it's really a matter of educating yourself, being prepared to know what's normal. It is incredibly uh, overwhelming and stressful when you have a, a new baby. If you don't know what to expect is normal, I strongly encourage you to use that log that uh, Dr. Vicentine, I think, went over to sort of prepare yourself to know that you can't see what's in the bottle, but if you see that the stools are transitioning and the urines are going, that you can feel confident that things are, are going okay. Um, so prepare yourself and then really to focus on your own personal goals. Don't worry about what your mother says, your best friend or Facebook, um, you and your partner figure it out and then you get the support you need, whether that's friends and family, your mother, your supportive Facebook group, um, and obviously uh, supportive professionals. So I think really one of the things that you uh, can do is make sure to find a pediatrician who's going to be supportive and knowledgeable uh, because unknowingly breast uh, pediatricians will sometimes undermine your efforts just because they don't know. And uh, it's a really great question when you're doing prenatal, if you're interviewing pediatricians or you're exploring pediatricians, uh, to, to ask about their lactation support and their breastfeeding support. And um, my particular preference is that women try and do prenatal breastfeeding visits one-on-one. -on -one. So this is a, a nice webinar that gives you kind of an overview, but everybody has their own medical issues. They're worried about 
uh, that could contribute to uh, success or failure with lactation. So it's really nice to do a prenatal visit. I know that Dr. Edelstein and Dr. Uh, everybody on this panel does them. We do them virtually, so you can always schedule an appointment for that. And, um, and just to remember also uh, on the next slide, if you don't mind, Bree, there's how to directly reach Dr. Macaluso because she's the only one here who is exclusively dedicated to mother baby. So no matter who your pediatrician is, she's a resource for you. Um, the, the rest of us are there for your general pediatric care and help with lactation, but Dr. Macaluso really is exclusively focused on this. So, so you can definitely reach out to her. Uh, I think we also have, Bree is gonna send a phone number out for, we have a, um, a concierge newborn line that helps you sort of navigate finding, getting answers about newborn care in general, as well as if you need help finding uh, breastfeeding support. And many people reach out and get lactation consultants in the community, that's fine as well. Uh, again, you just wanna make sure that they're supporting your goals and not their own goals, just like us, we wanna support you. And we always follow two rules, we say, there's only two things that have to happen and that's that the baby has to be fed and the mother has to be happy and everything else is negotiable and we are here for you. So I think with that, what I'd like to do is just turn it over to Dr. Firestein who can um, read us some of the questions. I know a bunch came in in advance and um, maybe some others as well. Thank you, Dr. Cher. Um, so I, I know that Dr. Macaluso is agnostic to uh, any particular pediatrician, but I know Dr. Edelstein will see babies that don't necessarily follow you know, through at Pediatric Health Associates. Um, Jen and, and Lisa, do you guys out, also out in Faconic see babies that may go to another pediatrician? So um, we used to all the time. During COVID, we sort of locked down. <laughs> and only saw um, the bare minimum. I think that yes, in general, we will, but we haven't quite gotten to the point yet that we have reopened that. So soon, coming soon. <laughs> okay, but if you need them um, and you talk to the new parent hotline, they can probably help you arrange something if you, if you live way out there. Okay, um, Dr. Vizentine, I'm gonna ask you to comment on tongue tie. Um, you know, I've been doing pediatrics a long time, and in the last five years, tongue tie has apparently become a major problem that never existed before. Um, it seems to have happened with the existence of lasers to repair them. So we now have a tool that we seem to be using. Um, what's the real deal with, with tongue tie and interfering with lactation? Yeah. So just to take a step back um, so that everybody knows what we're talking about, underneath your tongue, there is a frenulum, a piece of tissue. Um, in some babies that can be very tight and in some babies it can be, be very loose. So um, a baby may have a tongue tie, um, but they may be able to freely move their tongue. Um, and depending on the function of the tongue is more important than whether or not a tongue tie is actually present. So there are ways that we can, when we examine the baby, um, especially when mom is there watching and feeding, in addition to examining the baby's mouth, looking at how that baby is feeding, if they are able to, for instance, stick out their tongue um, and elevate their tongue, when we look at that, we can see um, that that tongue tie is not restricting the baby's movement. Um, and so if a baby is gaining weight well, they're able to move their tongue appropriately that hasn't affected their function, then that baby may have a tongue tie, but it's not necessarily adversely affecting the baby's ability to nurse and even speak, because that's another question that we get um, often is, is the baby gonna be able to speak properly when they're older? Um, so yes, you see online, um, you Google it, you'll see everything from tongue ties don't exist to every baby who has a tongue tie needs to be lasered or have uh, an intervention. Um, and um, when I evaluate a baby, I'm looking at the function of their tongue. Are they able to appropriately latch, suck and swallow? Um, is mom not having any pain? Is that baby feeding well? If all of those things are happening, um, then that tongue tie is not causing a problem interfering with that baby's ability to feed. 
And, and if a baby does have a tongue tie, can mm -hmm. you comment on a baby that's lasered, which tends not to be covered by insurance versus a baby that goes to the ENT and just gets um, uh, it snipped, I guess is the right word. Yeah. Um, yeah. There are different ways to um, cut basically to loosen that, um, that frenulum. So if a baby's frenulum is very tight and it's restricting the movement of the tongue, that's a baby that would potentially be referred to have a, a procedure. Um, I personally refer those babies to an ENT um, that is generally covered by insurance. Um, and we do have a, an ENT um, that's near us that is experienced in the, in the procedure. Um, there are um, more commonly dentists um, who will have the lasers and do that procedure. Um, I don't know how deep we want to <laughs> go into this. Uh, um, some, sometimes uh, there can be a tendency, in my opinion, to over-diagnose that. Um, and, and they may not necessarily be looking at the function of the tongue. They may just be looking and saying, there's a frenulum there and I can remove it. Um, whereas when I personally am evaluating the baby, I'm looking more at the function of that baby's tongue, um, not just the presence of the tongue tie about whether or not it needs to be uh, addressed. So depending on, on who's looking at it, they may have a differing opinion of um, what may or may not need to be done about it. Thank you. Um, and talking about insurance, Dr. Macaluso, are these services covered by insurance or is this out of pocket for the patient? Should be covered by insurance. I, I think in stepping on um, Lisa's wonderful explanations, one of the things I was thinking to add on was it's, um, I hope I worded that well. <laughs> I didn't mean to step on you, Lisa. The, the there, there's, there's a lot of differing opinions on, on, uh, yeah, on Tante I, as, as most yeah. parents have. Yeah, <laughs> I wanted to just add on that it's helpful to really look at the mom and baby as well, aside from doing a really nice thorough exam, as she stated wonderfully, um, for the baby it can be really helpful to get that full feeding history of how feeds are going for mom and baby and is she having pain with latch is she having plug ducts Is the baby not draining her Is she having mastitis and signs that feeds aren't going well sometimes you get that history including the maternal history is really an important piece to help that family make a decision to move forward with a procedure or not. Um, the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine has a position statement on this area as well, and, and that there isn't enough research to declare that laser has superiority over scissors. Um, typically, most PN pediatric ENTs that perform frenulectomies will take insurance, and it, it is usually covered by an insurance, yes. Right. And speaking um, of insurance, because I don't want to confuse people, most of the people here are able to take insurance for lactation because we are also physicians, correct? So a lot of insurances don't cover lactation per se, but when it's done by a physician, they will cover it. I see everybody nodding, so I, I have that correct, yes. right? Okay. Yeah, the, the, American American Academy, the American Academy of Pediatrics has a, a statement on breastfeeding care for the pediatrician with protocols and codes and appropriate guides for billing. So yes, we bill insurance. I think it's always important to point out that as physicians, we're doing outpatient visits with moms and babies, usually seeing both as patients and once again are able to truly diagnose, treat, prescribe, refer, and provide thorough breastfeeding medical care. There are sometimes copays, but beyond that, <laughs> there's always a copay. <laughs> um, Dr. Edelstein. Um, so, you know, we talked about how stressful it can be at the beginning. And if you have, you know, a mom who wants some help, she has a baby nurse, dad's off. Is there anything that they can do at the beginning to help? Like, is it okay? How terrible is it? And I hate to phrase it that way to give one bottle during the night so mom can get some sleep, um, whether that's pumped milk or breast or formula or, or something along those lines. What do you think of that? So, with not answering your question directly, I will get to that, but um, I like to counsel families when I'm seeing them in the office for that newborn visit, that there's a lot of stuff to get done when you're having a baby. It's not just feeding. It's not um, giving 
grandparents the privilege of giving a bottle and being part of the feeding, they could be involved in so many ways, changing diapers, um, holding the baby when you're taking a shower, other things, helping get the baby dressed, helping the baby bathe. There's more to being a parent than just the feeding. There's more ways of being a supportive family member than just taking part in the feeding. So I try to give them other things that they could do to feel like they're bonding with their new baby without interrupting that breastfeeding relationship between baby and mom, which is a very unique, special bond. And that's okay. And that's something that should be celebrated. But is it okay to give a bottle? How dangerous love is that? I love that, by the way. I, I love that. I love that. Um, but how dangerous is it to give that one bottle? The other part about being in this new postpartum period is also maternal mental health. And that is so drastically important too. And postpartum baby blues are real. Postpartum anxiety and depression are so very real. And um, breastfeeding to an extent does help with that, but also could be a source of anxiety. But if there's a time when the the lactating parent, mom, um, lactating parent just feels like they need a break and they just need somebody to feed the baby that one bottle so they could go take that shower in peace or lay down for those two hours. If that's what mom needs, okay, so be it. Um, and that's totally fine as well. But also I think it's important to educate mom on the um, physiology of breastfeeding, how breast milk is made so then she could calculate in her mind, like, if I really want to have a great milk supply, probably it's not optimal for me to go ahead and get those eight hours of sleep a night from the get-go, but be able to make that decision, that educated decision, understanding the full package. Thank you. I see that a lot where moms are afraid that the baby's not getting enough, so then they supplement. And that's actually sabotaging their ability to make more and it becomes almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. And sometimes you just have to like step back and explain everything to them and, and see how they do with that. Um, so Dr. Macaluso, one of the moms was saying that her baby seems to like one breast better than the other. Is there a solution for that? Or is it okay to feed on that one more? This is an area where you definitely want to do detective work and take a full history and do a physical exam because you can have what we call breast asymmetry. You can have breasts that are different sizes. You can have nipples that are different shapes and sizes. Um, you definitely can see a one-sided preference um, in terms of women can have one nipple that is inverted. It does not come out as easily for the baby to latch onto deeply. So physical exam would be really important here to gather that. Um, yeah, I, I, this is an area that one of the cool parts of what we do for practice in breastfeeding medicine is it's fun detective work and you need to take a really good history and you need to do a physical exam of both parties and really help to come up with what's going on. I think another good take home for the previous question as well is one of the neat things we get to do in our office frequently too is what's called the test way where you can undress that baby, weigh the baby, usually with the diaper on because they pee or poop during the feed that counts. And you can weigh, feed, weigh, and show a mom. It's a really nice way to have her see objective data as to how much her baby took. And you can weigh each breast and see what's going on with each side and its individual right. Um, yeah, that would be a, a mom baby I would want to see live and take a full history and physical and help her to troubleshoot on what's going on and then come up with a plan of how to deal. So actually hands-on, right? It's still helpful. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> uh, Dr. Vizentine, um, Dr. Macaluso talked about pumping um, and you know silicone pumps and how they can be bad. Is there any point, you know, if you want to pump, if you know you're going back to work, like when to introduce that? And can you specifically comment on the haka? which is becoming very popular these days. Yes, <laughs> I think we've all uh, experienced this. So, so the Haka for people who may not be familiar with it um, is a silicone pump um, 
to me, it looks like a vase <laughs> with a little extra on it. Um, and what moms will do is they'll apply it to the breast that they're not nursing the baby on. And so it passively collects that milk. Um, and so in theory, the reason why people will use this and it's become popular is that a lot of moms will have some leaking, especially in the beginning, and they feel like that is being wasted. And then this was a way to collect it. Um, however, depending on how much that is being used, um, it can really stimulate mom's milk supply because that milk is pretty much constantly being removed while it's being worn. Um, and that removal is what then tells your body to make more milk. Um, so for some moms, it will really increase their milk supply to a point um, where it actually becomes not a good thing. They get uncomfortable, they may get pl plugged ducts, they may get engorged, which then makes it harder for the baby to latch on. Um, they may get mastitis because that milk is sitting in there. They're making a lot more than their baby needs. And then because they are full all the time, they feel like then they need to use the haka or pump to remove that milk. And it, it sort of becomes this cycle that it's making more milk, which makes them uncomfortable, which makes them have to remove the milk. But then the more you remove it, the more it, um, it makes. Um, so I just tell moms to be aware of that, um, that if they're going to use it, um, to just be mindful of, of how it can increase their supply. And, and that's not necessarily always a, 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 more is not always necessarily better uh, in this instance. You asked me another question though about sort of pumping in general and um, when to start pumping. Um, so I usually recommend for the first month of life, for moms to focus on nursing their baby. Um, there's a lot to get into a routine. Moms are recovering from childbirth. You're learning your baby's cues. Babies are eating every two hours and it can take them 30 to 40 minutes by time you feed them, change them, put them back down it's almost time to do it all over again. Um, and then if you add pumping in there, in addition to that, um, it, it can really be quite overwhelming. And if a baby is nursing well, um, there's really no need to add in that extra stress. So if moms are not going to be separated from their babies, I generally recommend that they wait at least that first month to get breastfeeding well-established before they try to introduce a pump. When we're talking about returning to work, moms, generally, you only need to have the first day's worth of milk when you go back. So for instance, we generally recommend about an ounce an hour. So if a mom's going to be working an eight hour day, she may have a commute on either end. She may be gone for nine to 10 hours. She may only need to leave her baby 10, 12 ounces total. She's going to try to feed the baby right before she goes to work. She's going to feed the baby when she returns home from work. Um, so the number of feedings that that baby will need while mom's gone somewhat depends on how old the baby is when mom returns to work. Um, but in general, I think there's an overestimation of how much milk a mom may need to leave for the baby. And it may seem like she needs to um, prepare for a very long time before they go back to work. Um, so so if mom has that milk stored up the first day, hopefully she'll be able to pump while she's at work. Baby will be fed the milk that she pumped prior to going to work. Mom pumps while she's at work and then she brings that milk home with her. And then that's what the baby gets the next day. And so every day that mom goes to work, she's pumping and replenishing that milk. So she doesn't need a huge freezer full. Unfortunately, the internet um, is full of all of these moms who have these giant deep freezers and, and, and that's really not... Um, typical of what most moms make and it's really not necessary. And I think it may give a um, unnecessary extra pressure on moms going back to work that they need to have this huge, um, huge supply. So for instance, an example, a mom going back to work, the baby's three months old, that baby's probably eating about every three to four hours. Um, that gives mom a lot more time during the day to add in even one pump. Um, if mom pumps once a day and gets an ounce or two, she does that for a week she has seven to 14 ounces. Um, if she does it for two weeks, she has 28 ounces and that's pumping once a day. Um, and so you don't have to have this huge amount of um, extra pumping prior to moms going back to work. Thank you. Dr. Sherrod, there were um, some questions about 
decreased milk supply, either due to work or having to be separated from the baby for surgery or personal reasons? And um, how do you increase your milk supply then? So, you know, that's, that's a bit of a complicated question because there's so much that goes into how to increase milk supply and what the factors are around what, it, what it's for. I think more, that would be a good telemed lactation visit discussion. <laughs> I would say, I will say that um, just to, to piggyback on what, what somebody said before, that really all of these pumping questions and issues are um, go back to the less is more concept, really, to try to keep it simple and make things basic. And um, just want to add one thing to what Dr. Vicentine was just saying is that while you want to just exclusively nurse in the first month, uh, if you know that you're going to need to bottle feed and go back to work, if you're not going back to work until six months, you really do want to introduce a bottle somewhere around four to six weeks so that they at least know how. I, I do think we see lots of women who are exclusively nursing and that's fine if that's all you want to do. But if you know you have to give a bottle later, you should let them practice using that after about six weeks. Excellent advice. So I, I think the bottom line here is that there are so many questions and most of them are individual. And that's why you um, lovely ladies and physicians are available by telemedicine in person to answer these kinds of questions. Uh, and we're gonna send out information on how to get in touch with you. Um, I just wanted to, to comment on the AAP. I think it's great that the AAP is trying to lead the effort. The AAP is the American Academy of Pediatrics to allow moms to continue to breastfeed. Because you're right, uh, Jen, that moms start to feel embarrassed at 15 months and 18 months. And even as pediatricians, uh, you know, sometimes we're like, well, what is she doing? Because that's kind of what society has done. But, you know, if you think back, my mom didn't even have me in a seatbelt. You know, we have pictures of me in the car. And then we used to have kids in car seats backwards until a year. And when we cho told them to go back till two years, everybody also was rolling their eyes. And now I don't even tell moms anymore at one not to turn the car seat around because they have no thought that they would even think to turn the car seat around until the child's two. So you got to start somewhere and you have to advocate. And I guess we're... We're starting here, so that's good. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. This was wonderful. I, I really love listening to all of you. I always learn something. And I'm excited that we helped so many parents today and that you guys are available to help even more. So congratulations to everybody who's listening. I'm sure we've answered a lot of questions, generated a lot more questions. Um, do a telemed visit we will send you information on how that can happen. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for having us. See you tomorrow, Lena. Bye. Bye. Good night. Bye.